He is risen. Do you catch the clue there? We say that repeatedly on Easter Sunday and in the Sundays following Easter, and we don't say he has risen as if it was a past event. We say he is risen because he is alive and very much a part of our lives and our days in this world until he delivers us to follow him in that path to eternal life. Today I'd like to share some words with you on the basis of the gospel for the day from Luke 24. I read it so I won't repeat it, but I'll refer to it through the sermon. Karl Barth, one of the 20th century's most renowned theologians, was riding a streetcar in Basel, Switzerland, where he lived and lectured. A tourist got on the bus on the streetcar he was riding and sat down next to him and After a while, they started up a casual conversation. And so Barth asked the tourist, he said, while you're here in the city, is there anything you would like to see? And he said, yes, he said, there is. He said, I would love to meet the theologian Karl Barth. Do you know him? And Barth paused and said, well, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. I shave his face every morning. The tourist got off the streetcar, ran back to his hotel, delighted that he had met the barber of Karl Barth. (laughs) A case of mistaken identity. He was in the presence of the very man himself and didn't recognize it. A second case of mistaken identity occurred on Easter Sunday with Mary Magdalene outside the tomb of Jesus. So caught up in her grief was she at not finding his body there to anoint that she didn't recognize the man who addressed her, thought him to be a gardener until he spoke her name, Mary, and then she knew he was her risen Lord. The third case of mistaken identity occurs in our story today about two disciples making their way on the road of Emmaus to Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. You remember how this day began. It began with the women going to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. But when they got there, the stone had been rolled away and they walked inside and two angels addressed them, two men, who reminded them that he is not here, he's alive. And then added, don't you remember when you were with him in Galilee that he told you he would be crucified and then be raised from the dead? And the women said, oh yeah, now we remember. Well, they didn't quite say it that way, but it did say they remembered. And they got so excited about it that they headed back to Jerusalem to tell the apostles about this who didn't believe the story, who thought it was nonsense. So Simon went to the tomb and walked in and saw the bed clothes there, the burial clothes, and left the tomb wondering, where was he? What had happened? Where was the body of Jesus? So the resurrection of Jesus is still in doubt when the two men are making their way to Emmaus. We don't know much about these two men. One was called Cleopas, which is a Greek name, which is appropriate, I suppose, since Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke to the Gentiles, to the Greek world and people who were not Jews. The other, because he's not named, maybe in humility, might have been Luke himself. But we don't know why they got out of town, unless it was for fear of the Jews, because they were still after the disciples of Jesus Christ, whom they had crucified. So it seemed like, I suppose, an appropriate time to get out of town while the getting was good, to save their necks. And they had probably been with the disciples, the apostles, when the women came back with the story because later they relate that to Jesus, that incident of the women's amazing story that he had risen. 
but they were discussing the events of the day, trying to make sense out of it, I suppose, because they didn't have cell phones. They had to talk, you know. And so this was a chance to kind of process things when suddenly Jesus himself, not angels, came up and walked along with them. And they didn't recognize him. How could that be? This man that surely they had known because they had followed him as disciples. How could that be? I think the secret lies in the Greek word here, which is krateo, which means their eyes were restrained. In other words, God was in this. Jesus was flexing his muscles so that they wouldn't recognize him immediately. It's interesting that that Greek word, that verb krateo, is related to the, the noun in Greek, kratos, which means the power and might of God. So you see, there was reason for them not to recognize Jesus. It came from above. Of course, their disappointment didn't help either. Because you see, their faces were downcast. They had expected something more of life. Something more of this Jesus than they got. They had expected him, they told Jesus, to be the deliverer, the redeemer of Israel. To get them out from under the Roman thumb. To set them up in power again. And what did they get? They got a body in a tomb. When life doesn't live up to our expectations, how difficult is it for you to see the living Jesus? If illness hangs on too long, if you have a problem at work, if you're going through financial difficulties in your life, if you suffered a tragedy that you hadn't seen coming, how difficult is it for you to see the risen Jesus. Just don't ever assume that your disappointment is the final word in any of these situations. Jesus always has a better answer. After the crucifixion came the resurrection, right? He had something better planned, something better in store for them. So you can be sure because of the fact that God clouded their minds a little bit so they couldn't recognize Jesus and because of their own disappointment, because their faces were downcast, it says, they never expected to see Jesus on the road to Emmaus with them. They thought he was some kind of an uninformed visitor to Jerusalem, one of the people coming up for the festival of Passover. How could he not have heard what had happened to Jesus? How could he not know what was going on? A case of mistaken identity. And then Jesus admonishes them for their lack of faith, reminding them that they didn't believe enough in the prophecies of the Old Testament in the plan of salvation that he had shared with them repeatedly when they sat at his feet. And then, beginning with Moses and the prophet, he explained to them what was in all the scriptures concerning himself. Wouldn't you have liked to have been in that Bible study? I'm sure he lived, uses his cliff notes. Because, you know, if he had told them everything, they would have been there for days and days and days. But they were fascinated. And when Jesus started to pass on and go beyond them elsewhere, they imposed on him to stay with them. Which might imply that Emmaus was their hometown and they could give him shelter there. And so, when they did, they sat down to dinner. And Jesus took the lead. 
and broke the bread and blessed it and started to distribute it to them when suddenly, like Paul, who was blinded to Christ, suddenly the eyes are no longer restrained and they can see. And in that moment, Jesus disappeared. Just when they would have loved more time with him, just when they would have loved to praise him for being the resurrected Christ who won the victory for them and helped them to understand what was going on, he was not around. So in their excitement, they rushed back to Jerusalem where the apostles were still gathered in that room. And they thought, boy, do we have a story to tell. But when they got there, the text says they already knew because Jesus had appeared to Simon. It didn't keep them from sharing their story. They were delighted to do so. Sometimes, sometimes we have that same block to our vision of the risen Lord. Someone in this room today may be distracted from your Easter faith by the dis disappointment and despair going on in your life. Maybe you're blinded because of what's going on. You may not even realize that he is present with you right now. Did you come to church today? Or did you come to meet the risen Lord? Because he said, where two or three of you are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That's Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Do you see him? Do you know where to find him? He's in this word of the Bible that shares with you Old and New Testament so that you might know who he is and what he's done and all that it means for your life. John Calvin, the French reformer in the Reformation, once said that the Bible is like a pair of glasses. He said, it's not a spiritual encyclopedia where you go look up answers to the questions you have. Although we use it that way a lot, don't we? But the truth is that sometimes the Bible doesn't have answers to what we're going through. Sometimes it doesn't tell us the why of what's happening. You remember in the case of Job, he never got an answer, except for the fact that God said, I know what I'm doing. It's the only answer we're going to get to that question. But we may not find enough to understand why we're going through disappointments and setbacks in life. We may not know what God is doing, but understanding is not the key to life. Faith is. Faith is. And those eyeglasses of the scripture don't, us allow, uh, don't allow us to see always what's going to happen to us, but it will help us to take that next step, of, next step of faith that we need to take, knowing that as we move into the future, the Lord who is king over the future will never forget us nor neglect us He'll always be there for us. You've heard the expression, seeing is believing. If you live by that in life, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see a lot of skepticism, a lot of doubt. There's a second vantage point called believing is seeing. If you look at the, the, through the scriptures, the eyes, glasses of God, to look at your life, then you will begin to see faith and hope when you look through those eyeglasses. In other words, they have to be believed in order to see. Isn't that true of all the resurrection appearances that Jesus made? He made them to people who believed in him. People of faith who could see him, who knew him for who he was, for who he had been trying to teach them who he was. 
and for all that he was going to do for them in their lives and in the future. They had to believe in order to see the risen Lord. How many of you have been to Disneyland? Good. How many have been to Disney World? Oh, I didn't realize so few. That's all right. That's okay. Arthur uh, Nelson Searcy once took his son to Disney World. They had an exciting time. Man, they did everything together. They rode the rides, they watched the parade, they ate the food, they walked around seeing all the displays and, and all the uh, movies and met all the creatures in the walkway, you know, shook hands with them, took pictures, and were about to leave one day. Had a great time. We're planning to come back again to see more. When somebody gave them a different vantage point, a different point of view on how to see that theme park. They said, did you see the hidden Mickeys? The hidden Mickeys, what are those? Well, around the park, the people who created it thought it was creative to put little interlocking three circles showing the face and the body and the ears of Mickey Mouse. They're etched in the cement. They're painted on the walls. They're in the landscaping if you look closely enough, but many people go through that whole theme park and never see it because they don't have the right vantage point. They didn't know they were there. When you know they're there, they appear everywhere. You can't see enough of them. There are so many. That's the way it is with eyes of faith. That when you're looking at life through the Bible eyeglasses, it will show you things that you haven't seen before about Jesus and what he's doing in your life. It's the life of faith. And when something happens, good or bad, some people will see it as a, a terrible accident or a coincident or just an instance. But people of faith, see it as opportunity. They see it as a miracle in the hand of God. Every day he gives life. Think about that. To the millions of people he gives life in the world. To the millions of people he feeds every day. We always look at the, uh, what the insurance people call the acts of God, which are tornadoes, floods. They always give God a bad reputation. Eyes of faith don't do that. Eyes of faith see this life that is new every day that God gives us. Every morning when we get up and when we see eyes, see life through eyes of faith, then it will increase our faith and our awareness of God's presence. I believe it was no accident that Jesus had the uh, two disciples recount everything that they had been seeing in the past few days, everything they experienced, everything they knew about him so that he could add to it, so that they would begin to focus on that and he could finally open their eyes so that they would recognize him as the one he promised to be, the risen Lord and victory over death and sin and the devil. The value of gathering each week as we do in worship is to put on those glasses of the Bible, to see light through them for a change, to remind ourselves of what God is doing in this world of the Bible and in our world today. And when we see the risen Lord, that we need to believe in him and to visit with him regularly it's no accident that the two disciples finally recognized Jesus through that very familiar act that he had done so often with them. To sit at table, to break the bread, to bless it, and to distribute it to them. And people have discovered for almost 2,000 years, every time the bread is broken and the cup is shared in Holy Communion, that the risen Lord is right here, giving himself to you. 
reassuring you that you are forgiven, sending you out with a new lease on life itself, with a new slate, because he is risen. He is risen indeed. And that's why I invite you this morning to come again to that most holy meal, because Jesus is the one who is going to break the bread, bless it, and give it to you for your assurance and for your life in this difficult world. Put on those glasses of faith and take off the glasses of skepticism and doubt. And life will take on new meaning and new wonder for you. Remember what Thomas said? I will not believe until I see. And Jesus says in chapter 20 of John, verse 29, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Put on the glasses of faith. All that Christ has taught you about who he is, about what he's willing to do, about the promises that he makes to you from the scriptures themselves. And you will see the risen Lord in your world and in your life more clearly and more often. Amen.